Please pray with me. Almighty and ever-present God, as we come before you on the feast day of your, of your Son's transfiguration, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you might allow us to see more clearly who Jesus is, not only in our lives, but in the life of the whole world. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, greetings and welcome to you who are tuning in uh, on the feast day of Jesus' transfiguration. Uh, we heard from Luke's gospel uh, about this particular moment in the life and ministry of Jesus where the disciples, and by their witness, we get a glimpse into the fullness of Jesus' identity. And that Jesus as being fully human is also fully God. And the Feast of the Transfiguration is a commemoration of that particular moment. This feast day has been celebrated in Christianity for uh, about 1,500 years. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's been celebrated in the liturgical calendar since the late 4th century. And in the West, we started celebrating it around the 9th century. Now, as I was preparing for my homily today, uh, I couldn't help but think about uh, the 2002 film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And uh, you might be thinking, what's the connection there? Well, the connection I was thinking about is when the father in the film, again and again, says that there's uh, a Greek word behind this English word, or a lot of our English words come from Greek, and, and that is true to a certain extent. Uh, and so as I was looking into the etymological roots and, of the word transfiguration and what that means, uh, I dug into my Greek grammar book, um, and I couldn't find transfiguration. And some of you might uh, inwardly be smirking, uh, knowing that transfiguration comes from the Latin. So at least in this instance, the father from my big fat Greek wedding was wrong, because transfiguration comes from Latin. And though I don't have a lot of background in Latin, my understanding is that it's a compound uh, word between uh, the preposition trans, meaning across, and uh, the word we get our English word from figure, meaning form or bodily shape. And it, the transfiguration is this celebration of Jesus' divinity being uh, brought across or pulled forth or shining through his human identity. And Jesus is both fully human and divine. And Jesus' nature as both fully human and divine is, isn't confused or is not mixed together. Jesus is somehow at once both of those things. And in the Feast of the Transfiguration, we celebrate this brilliant glimpse into the fullness of Jesus' identity that is recorded in the Gospels. And as we heard today in particular from Luke's Gospel in chapter 9. Now, Jesus' divine identity as God's Son is confirmed or on display in, in two ways in our reading from Luke today. The first is that Jesus' physical, Jesus' physical um, form is transfigured. Again, Jesus doesn't change who he is in this moment. Jesus is the same person before, in, and after this moment. But this particular moment of Jesus' transfiguration is a physical display of his divinity. We hear that the appearance of Jesus' face is changed and that his clothes become dazzling white. Some commentators suggest that this event might have taken place during the evening. And I can only imagine whatever the particular mountainside that Jesus was on with those disciples, that it must have lit up like no other lighthouse or beacon had lit up before or after. And so Jesus' physical appearance is transfigured uh, in that moment. In some ways, this uh, both parallels and is also an inversion of our Old Testament re reading we heard uh, about Moses' time on a mountain before God's presence. Moses also has this physical effect from his time in God's presence in that his face shines 
And Moses' face shines perpetually so that when he goes off the mountain, he actually has to veil his face so he isn't blinding or scaring uh, the people um, that he is returning to. The, the difference uh, in these two moments is that Moses' face shines, as commentators and others have suggested it, Moses' face shines as a reflection of God's glory, of having spent time in God's holy presence. Jesus' face and physical appearance, in contrast, shines radiantly from within. Jesus' light as the Son of God shines through him as a witness and confirmation of his divinity. Now, the other moment in this passage where Jesus' uh, divinity is confirmed is in God's own voice, where near the end of this passage, uh, a mysterious cloud covers Jesus and his disciples uh, alongside Moses and Elijah who were there at that moment. And God says from the cloud, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And so there's a direct confirmation of Jesus' identity in relation to God the Father. Now this direct confirmation of who Jesus is and his divine sonship comes towards the end of his ministry. And in fact, this moment of Jesus' transfiguration is probably only a couple of weeks away from his crucifixion. The other moment in Luke's Gospel where this happens is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when in his baptism, God again, or God first says, this is my beloved son, my chosen. And so twice in Luke's Gospel, once at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and now towards the end of his earthly life and ministry, we hear God say, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And so we have these two moments in the transfiguration that give us a glimpse into the fullness of Jesus' divinity as God's only Son. Now, there's a couple other things that are going on in this passage as well. Uh, one question you might have is, what are Moses and Elijah doing there? Uh, these two figures appear alongside Jesus also in glory, while Jesus is radiant and uh, they are talking with him. Now, uh, it seems most likely that both Moses and Elijah are there as witnesses of the law and the prophets. There's a lot other things that um, perhaps they could symbolize, and, and, and there's a lot that um, one could say about this particular part of the passage. But I think the bottom line here is that Moses as the lawgiver in the Jewish tradition, and Elijah as, a, uh, as one representative of the prophets, and Elijah as a great prophet at that, they are there as witnesses to Jesus, that the law and the prophets witness to Jesus, and that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So Moses and Elijah, as witnesses of the law and the prophets to Jesus' divinity as God's son, to his identity as the Messiah of Israel, as the Messiah of the world, Moses and Elijah appear alongside Jesus and are conversing with him. Now in the passage it says that they were speaking about Jesus' departure. This is also another really interesting feature of this passage because in, our, in the Greek, um, that word comes from Exodus. So, what is translated as departure comes from uh, this idea of exodus, this word of exodus. And this is an important parallel, again, to Moses. Because Moses was chosen by God to lead the people of Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And that paradigmatic event of God's salvation and the life in the people of Israel is known to us as the exodus. And so as Moses and Elijah are speaking with Jesus about his departure, about his death, about his resurrection and ascension, they are talking with Jesus about the exodus that he will lead. And this exodus, again, is for the people of Israel, and it's also for the whole world. 
It's for all who are to come, all who have been. Jesus' exodus that he accomplishes through his own sacrifice, through his own blood, through his own suffering of hardship on our behalf, Jesus' exodus wins a salvation for all, for all who call upon his name. So that's another interesting and important feature that I want to highlight in today's passage in this wider context of Jesus' transfiguration. One other point I just briefly want to think about is the question or matter of Peter's response in his words to Jesus. I've always been confused about Peter's response here and, and what is he meaning, why does he say what he says, and, and even Luke in his account of this event that Peter didn't really know what he was saying, he kind of just said something. And it's quite uh, understandable that Peter would be astonished or amazed or dazed or confused, not only being heavy with sleep, but then seeing Jesus blindingly transfigured in brilliant light and seeing Moses and Elijah alongside him. And so Peter's response to this, I think, is to say, Lord, let's build three, three tents. Let me construct three shrines for you all here. Let's, let's stay in this moment of glory. And Peter and Jesus have a bit of a back and forth in Luke's gospel in that as Jesus' identity as the Messiah, as the Son of God, is becoming clearer and clearer, it's also clearer and clearer that Jesus has to suffer and die, that Jesus is a different kind of Messiah than the one Peter expected. Jesus says his path to glory, a glory which he has known with God the Father since before time even began, Jesus' path in his earthly life to glory must go through suffering. There's a great inversion in that. Jesus doesn't win salvation on our behalf through an initial display of power and might, though that's there. And we expect that upon his return. But instead, Jesus wins that path for us in the whole world through his humility, through his sacrifice, through his suffering. And Peter wants to dissuade Jesus from going down this path because he expects a different kind of Messiah. And I suspect Peter also intuited that if that's the path his Lord would follow to get to glory, to get to a place of power and salvation for all people, that Peter would also have to tread that path. And so it's this interesting scene in the midst of Jesus' glory and brilliance that Peter says, let's, let's stay here. Let's take a short cut to glory. Let's set aside the suffering that you have to do on behalf of the world and that I'm going to be involved in at some point. Let's set that aside and just stay here. Peter wants a shortcut, excuse me, a shortcut to glory. And yet that's not the path that Jesus takes. Jesus is fully God and fully human. Jesus's glory was never in question. And in the transfiguration, we see a glimpse into the brilliance of Jesus's glory. But he doesn't stay there. He doesn't stop there. Ultimately, in a short time from this event, he goes to the cross on our behalf so that we might also participate in Jesus' glory. So that we might have a path to glory, to sharing in the fullness of God's divine life through his son, Jesus Christ. So those are a couple things I, I wanted to highlight and recap in today's gospel passage about the transfiguration. And so I, I end with what I offer as two takeaways that we might carry with us as we celebrate the feast of Jesus' transfiguration this day and its meaning for our lives and the life of the world. And the first is a simple one. There's a connection between what happened on that mountain that day when Jesus was transfigured in the sight of those three disciples and what we say and confess in our liturgy every week. It's part of the reason that we confess in the Nicene Creed that we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God. We say this and we confess this and we believe this because we get this glimpse of the fullness of who Jesus is in both his humanity and his divinity in the transfiguration. So that's one takeaway. The other takeaway I want to offer comes uh, from a friend of mine who, uh, as we were discussing this passage, suggested that uh, perhaps we overcomplicate things uh, sometimes when it comes to a life of faith and devotion. And what does it mean to be part of the life and liturgy of the church? And my friend highlighted this verse where God says, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And the point is that Jesus is God's son. And God admonished the disciples then as God does to us now to listen to Jesus. And we are given grace through the Spirit to hear Jesus' words in our own lives, both when we come together uh, and perhaps uh, when we're about in our daily lives in ways that come to us hidden in our hearts. And we are called to listen to Jesus. It's both that easy and it's that hard. But here's, if you will, the real easy part in all of that, or, or perhaps uh, the part that calls to us in the midst of all of this and who Jesus is and his call in our lives, is that Jesus is God's son, that Jesus is beloved of God. And there's so much to be said about all of that. And what does that mean in all areas of our lives? What does that mean in all areas of the world? And the gospel, the message of Christ, is multivalent. There's so much to it. But in an attempt not to overcomplicate things right now, as my friend uh, might remind me, at the core of this is that Jesus as God's chosen, that Jesus as God's anointed, Jesus as God's beloved, also Jesus loves us. This is the meaning of Jesus' life, his death and his resurrection in that in his humanity, Jesus being fully God and taking on a human body, Jesus then makes a fuller relationship with God possible for us because now we go to God through Jesus. There's an actual means and way, an actual person that we can go to God through and Jesus is that mediator. The one who is fully human, who, who can who we can relate to in his humanity, but one who's also fully divine and, could, and can go to God on our behalf. And so Jesus, in all of this, loves us. He desires a relationship with us. He desires a relationship with you, with me. And now I'm talking on and on, and, and so, again, without overcomplicating it, Jesus desires to be in relationship with us. That's part of the meaning of the transfiguration. And that Jesus in his glory and radiance was willing to suffer hardship and pain and humiliation so that we might be in relationship with him, that we might be reconciled to God, that we might have the hope of eternal life both in the world to come and in this world. And so as we celebrate the feast of Jesus' transfiguration, whatever that means for the world at large, whatever that means for our lives as well, might we hear Jesus' call to be in relationship with him. In his glory, might we see his greatness and also his desire for us to share in the fullness of his divine life that he won on our behalf. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.